Nubia, a different perspective on the African world. You go to church on Sunday. There is no love in your heart on Monday. You're trying to show that you know yourself. Purify your heart, then you know yourself. Purify your heart, then you know yourself. Interview with Nim in Juguna, the chaplain of Anglian Ruskin University in Cambridge and also from the Nakuru Environmental and Conservation Trust. Welcome, Nim. Thank you. Could you just give us a bit of your background? Uh, just a little correction. I'm at the moment an associate chaplain at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge and I've just been working in Cambridge for three years now. I was working as the director of Cambridge Ethnic Community Forum and also as chair of Nakuru Environmental and Conservation Trust. I come from Kenya and have been in this country for many, many years. So tell us a bit about the work of the Nakuru Environmental and Conservation Trust. We call it NECT, N-E-C-T for short, and we work with young people up to the ages of 24. We work both in UK and in Kenya. In UK, we work in partnership with Mosaic Partnership to get young and old BME communities to the countryside. We also work to take people to Kenya, young people and old, who want to come to Kenya and work in a field study center and also as part of what we call education development trips. So what kind of things go on at the education center? The education center in Akuru in Kenya we teach community groups things like water harvesting, amaranth growing, which is a new crop in the country, which was only gazetted as a food crop in 1992. We do composting, beekeeping, primary health care, solar cooking, and also a bit of community empowerment programs. Because how much land do you have? The centre itself has 20 acres of land and has also a community house where we welcome visitors from abroad and from the country itself. Okay, how long has that been running? It's been running for about, from 1997, it's about 10 years, 10 okay. years ago. So is it well received in the community? Well, it has been well received, it's um, accepted by the community. We did a participatory rural appraisal, which is a program of working with the community groups and this was funded by the World Bank office in Kenya. The exercise was to ask people, the community, what they wanted for themselves and for their community, and what the obstacles were, and possible ways of overcoming these obstacles. The food you grow, the services you offer, are they for like immediate local consumption, or are they more for like mass export? It's very much for local consumption. Issues of food security, are crucial to the community and therefore good farming method and by good farming method we talk about going back to the way we used to farm lands in Africa so that's what we are teaching people how to grow their own food in order to eliminate their food insecurity. Nakuru was in one of the major trouble zones um, following the recent elections did that affect the work you were doing? Uh, not directly but where the Field Study Centre is based, is now, as we speak, host to about 4,000 refugees from other parts of Kenya. And that's where the community has been able to welcome and support them, partly because about a third of the community around where the Field Study Centre is based were themselves survivors of the ethnic clashes in Kenya in 1992. So they know what it is like. I'll give you an example. When these 3,000 people came, 
each member of the existing community donated enough money to build temporary school within two weeks they themselves were able to start educating and start teaching the students who had come from other parts of the country where they had been kicked out. You mentioned like the 3,000 people, are they from like across the groups in the area like, or are they all from one ethnic Pre group? Predominantly from one ethnic group. Which one's that? That's Kikuyu. Okay. Is that just because they're the majority of people there, or they were the majority of people who were victimised in that area? It's because the host community they found there were predominantly Kikuyu, but also it's only two hours drive from Nairobi to Nakuru, and they had come about four hours from uh, other parts of Kenya. Okay. So, I mean... Are there other groups in that area? I mean, I'm oh, yes. Last yeah. time, is, that, is that like Kalenjin type area around there? Where we are based, at Baruk, which is about eight miles from Nakuru town, you've got all kinds of communities living mm. there. Because next to our centre uh, is the Dalamea estate, which is a, an estate that has been there, owned by the Dalamea family. Uh, Lord Delamere and his family. In fact, we bought land from the Delameres to be able to do the work that we are doing now, although this happened in the 70s. So there are other tribes in the area. The local schools, the immediate local schools, has uh, students from many, many different tribes, but predominantly Kikuyu. Overall, how was the local economy and people's livelihoods affected by the violence? Again, some communities and some people and some individuals suffered much more than the others. But what has happened generally, the reports we are getting, is that the devastation of the economy, the local economy, not only in terms of, for example, take about the tea industry. The tea industry in Kericho, which is just near Nakuru and near Eldoret, where the problems were, they no longer can harvest their tea. So the tea prices has gone up because nobody is, you know, they have reduced capacity to harvest their tea. The road or the transport from Mombasa, which is the port, to Nakuru and beyond has meant that some people have not been able to replenish their goods, but also the prices have rocketed for some people, which has also means that um, some people's hunger has gone up meaning they are now depending on handouts. So you have some people benefiting from the cows in that they are able to bring in the goods by mm. air and by other means who don't depend on public transport. They can bypass that. But you've got a small trader. I have a cousin of mine who has lost his entire shop because it was looted, but neither can he replenish it. You also remember, you've got some people who could not go to work and therefore you had to shut down the machinery and people are fearful of going to start uh, the production lines. It is going to hit the Kenyan economy in terms of mainly tourism if people are not coming. And if you undermine the tourist industry in Kenya, you undermine many, many other livelihoods of so many other people in Kenya. You undermine the whole hospitality industry, the whole tourism industry in terms of transportation, and in terms of receipts at the gates of the national parks. Right, you mentioned national parks, and obviously some of the bigger estates are run by Europeans, yeah? Like you mentioned the Delamere and such, like, were they affected in the same way as the ordinary Kenyan was affected? Of course not. Just remember, there is not just the big farms, but you've got very, very wealthy Kenyan who are not affected and have never been affected by any local troubles. These are people who sustain themselves. These are people who come winter shopping to Britain. These are people who own businesses here and other parts of Europe. They're not just the whites, but uh, there's a clique of very wealthy Kenyan people who made loads of money throughout the last 40 years of so-called independence. So these people are in cahoots with others to keep their position and their world intact. Like the ones who are indigenous Kenyans, are they from one group of people or do they stretch right across all the ethnic groups across the whole country? Right across the tribal groupings in Kenya. 
you are talking about the equivalent of an upper class in this country, but an upper class of people in Kenya whose status is guaranteed by their wealth, the capacity to generate even more wealth, whether they are chaos or not, because their wealth is secure. It's not only in Kenya, it's also outside Kenya. Because one thing I did notice is that a lot of these political leaders, I mean, they were in parties together, they fell out with each other, they're the leader of the next party, they're the leader of the opposition party, they hand over power to each other, they fall out with each other. And I'm kind of saying, well, hold on a minute, two things. One, it doesn't seem like there's any ideological differences between them. And B, it don't seem like whichever way they resolve it, there's any benefit for the ordinary person. I think you're right to some extent. They don't be taken in by public pronouncements of some of the politicians, or most of the politicians, in terms of how they are different from their opponent. These are people who socialize together. Their families, their children, their wives belong to the same social clubs in Nairobi, Muthaiga Golf Club, Parkland Social Club and places like that. You are talking about people who have made their money over a long period of time and they've been friends for a long, long time because, as you said, they've been the same party, same social grouping, same experiences. These are the people who consume the same kind of so-called culture. And because there is nothing, as you rightly put, ideologically to split them, the saying in Kenya is, it's our time to eat. Mm. Whose time is it to eat? Meaning, who will take the power? And once you take the power, my tribe, my family, my extended family, will see doors open to opportunities they never dreamed of. Not on merit. No, because it is our time to eat. And when you have that ideology of our time to eat, you are not thinking with a national mind. You are just thinking very much in a tribal, with a tribal mind. So then, with this peace deal that has just been signed between Mwakabaki and Rilo Odinga, that peace deal then is just between them, really. Comment on that first, and then I'll expand on it. I wouldn't personally dismiss it offhand. First of all, because from the reports we are getting from people on the ground, they are accepting it as a a good compromise that will allow them to start picking the pieces of their lives together and start rebuilding their lives. So purely at, on that immediate pragmatic level, it's acceptable. The other side I would see it is acceptable is for the first time you do have, remember this is not the first time we have had a prime minister. Jomo Kenyatta was a prime minister for a little while uh, in the first government. So. If we are now going to have a parliament where the powers, almost the to totalitarian powers of the president are curtailed by a prime minister or a prime ministerial office, that would be a good thing. Of course, the problem is it has come about through, if you want, the barrel of a gun mm. to some extent. And therefore, it's partly it's a face saving exercise. It's a compromise that gets the other party to have something to offer to their constituency by saying, we may have lost the election or the presidency, but at least we've got some power back. Now, the president cannot dismiss the prime minister, which is another guarantee that Mwaki Baki has had to concede, because that was the sticking point. Up to the last minute, Mwaki Baki wanted to have the ultimate power uh, to be able to dismiss not only the Prime Minister, but the government. This compromise, which only will last for four years, means that we'll now have a much open, transparent election in 2012, when Kibaki will be about, I think, 80 years old. Raila Odinga will be about 66. And I don't see Kibaki going back into Parliament after that. So it's expected that like a new generation of politicians... There is a generation... A generational change has already happened. It's only that they don't have the power, because the power resides in the old guard. This is the last of the old guard's chance to influence the future of the country.
and I don't think they have any influence anymore. Last year, there was a big shootout, and there were supposed to be all these dead people, all these people getting killed by Mungike, right? The sect Mungike. And there was a big raid in the squatter camps and everything. This year, it said, oh, um, Kabaki had actually engaged Mungike to carry out attacks and revenge attacks on people in the post-election in violence. You sign an agreement with the politician, but the politician decides like, well, I still want my people to run it. I still want certain people involved. People that last year I said were the biggest threat to the stability of the state. This year I'm engaging them to carry out revenge attacks on people. What about that situation? To be quite honest, I haven't met anybody or talked to anybody in Kenya who believes that Mungiki was used by the government to carry out atrocities. People keep pointing out to me that the opposition was claiming that the police force and the army was compromised. Remember, Kenya is one of the few countries in Africa where the government or the army has always been under the judiciary. Now, what people are telling me, uh, and the question somebody put to me, but why use Mungiki, who are so identifiable Kikuyu, whom you can pick up in a crowd, while you've got the army and the police, who could be doing the work anyway? Mungiki itself has, of course, said there's a rogue element within the Mungiki that defied the authority of the Mungiki organization and went on their own. It could be true. It also could be point scoring. It could be power play within the Mungiki. Very few people would admittedly admit to being belonging to Mungiki. You don't belong to Mungiki if you want to go to be part of the, the civil society. They are seen as marginal to the civil society. They are seen as a rogue element within the socio-political movement in Kenya. But when you have unemployment so high, and especially among the young people, when you have the community, like in, uh, in Mathari, marginalized, unconsulted, abused, used. Of course, that's when people like Mungiki will fester. If you have somebody who clearly points out to you what the government is not doing for you, and they can offer you hope, well, you can see why people in those shanty towns go for Mungiki. So Mungiki has attracted people who have been left behind by the so-called social progress of the government of Kenya. But I would take it with a pinch of salt that Mungiki went to State House and had um, dinner with the president and cup of tea or whatever they had. I mean, I'll take that with a, with a pinch of salt, to be honest. Probably on the other side, within other communities, right, they have the same, you know, they have maybe those same kind of elements who, yeah, they can be called on to go and destabilize whatever needs to be destabilized at any point in time. Well, yes, I mean, some of the reports coming from Eldoret was that the meetings were held among the Kalenjin people prior to the election in order to map out the response if and when the elections did not go their way. Now, these are allegations. What is not allegations is what we've actually seen happening, like the burning of the churches and killing of people. But as to the motivation for those activities, any organization, as I, as I said mm. earlier on, 1992, the Kikuyus mm. were kicked out. They were kicked out from one particular area by one particular tribe. So what was that area? That is Molo, uh, Londiani, uh, which is about 60 miles from Nakuru. Okay. And that's when these people came to. Now, that is very well documented, and they're still waiting because the World Jurists Movement has been taking on and has been taking evidence for the last probably since 1992. So the case is still pending. Is that what, is that what human rights abuse case or yep. compensation yeah. cases? Or? Yes. So most people will see that, that the peace agreement will actually bring a level of stability nationwide then, you reckon? I don't think it's a level of stability. It will stop the mayhem and the killing. And then it allows for a time for rational people mm -hmm. to begin to the dialogue about the troubles. What are the kind of dialogues that have been had in the country? 
or by people in the diaspora who are kind of looking at the situation and saying, this isn't what we want for our country or this isn't what we, even what we want for our region? I know of two groups, one called the Moderates, and um, I forget the other one, but I get their emails every now and again, who have been holding meetings both in Nairobi and in other parts of Kenya. And at the moment, they, they are at the stage of just beginning to critique what happened and to begin to understand what happened from a different perspectives. So they are collecting views from different Kenyan people's societies, organizations, in order to begin to address those issues. So it's a groundswell movement. It's a movement from the ground that is beginning to try to understand what happened. Because one of the things they found very difficult to comprehend is why neighbors who had, of course, lived together for years could suddenly turn on each other. They're trying not to understand it, not at a political level first, but purely at a neighborly, social, community level. Okay, because obviously, I mean, certain relationships, certain houses, certain businesses need to be rebuilt. They do. And they cannot be rebuilt by ostracizing one community. Those same communities that burn down by their neighbor's area happen to be burning their own area. So those people have to come back. It's almost a mini reconciliation mm -hmm. exercise going on at the moment. So, so a lot of the refugees, right, a lot of the people who moved out from whatever area they were in, do most of them actually say, I actually want to go back to where I was immediately removed from? What I'm told, the 4,000 people who have come near our centre, most of them don't want to go back. These are people who have said, we saw the mass movement in 1992, we've seen it now in 2008. Unless there are guarantees by the government, and by guarantees I mean they would like to see some sort of court case, put it mm. bluntly. Yeah. These are people who have lost their livelihood, They've lost their lives or the lives of their loved ones. These are people who for years have been working hard and have bought their mm. own property. So these are people who said, unless there is a redress to mm. these grievances first, they won't go back. Well, they just moved to Nairobi and become more people living in the slums of Nairobi. Is that what's going to happen? That's the problem. That's the problem because they've got to go somewhere. They've got to start their lives somewhere again. Wherever they go, you're going to put strain on the local economy, schools, hospitals. So these are people who have been deprived. These are people who have lost everything they have worked. These are people who fled with very little. And yet I expect to start all over again. As if they have tons of money to start their mm -hmm. lives again. They don't. So you're going to have a deprived community. People who are now going to start new shanty towns in other places. And we know once you start a shanty town as a temporary measure, it becomes a permanent settlement. I mean, you mentioned the 3,000 that are at your place near Nakuru. Um, countrywide, I mean, the numbers they were talking was, what, 250, 300,000? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Displaced people? Yeah. And I think it's time that the whole question of land distribution was actually taken on and debated as a legitimate claim by different tribes. There is no way we can go forward, I think, in Kenya without nailing down the land problem. But then you've got, I mean, okay, you've got two or three issues come up from that. One is you've got, like, the Kikuyus, for instance, who benefited from uh, independence claiming certain land. And you've got people who say, well, okay, before even the Kikuyus managed to benefit from getting that land, that land belonged to somebody else maybe a hundred years ago. So you've got those kind of historic grievances. Then you've got, like, the white families that are there who are just keeping quiet, but they feel like, okay, we've given up all the land we're going to give up, right? And obviously, when that land redistribution issue comes up, you have people raising the specter of, oh, it's all going to go down to small, uneconomic units. It's better that a big person has it and has, like, lots of land because then it's more economic to run a business. I've got another couple of points, but I want you to speak on those first. Well, remember that in 1945, compare Kenya with Holland for a moment. 1945, Holland had 5 million people population. Kenya had 5 million. 2008, 
Holland has roughly the same. Kenya has about 38 million. When the land was being distributed, the original land in 1963, Kenya had only a population of 8 million people. And the Kenya, the newly Kenya government, was given loans by the British government to buy off white farms. It bought off white farms. It distributed to people who were landless. Of course, some got more than the others because it depended on who was making those land decisions at that time. Kikuyus have not only benefited because of having been in power or Kenyatta having been in power at the beginning. The other factors, i.e. that Kikuyu land is near Nairobi. There are many Kikuyu schools and hospitals and the Kikuyu started fighting for independence long before other people started fighting for independence. So people had, there was, I'm not saying Kikuyu as a tribe, there were some Kikuyu individuals who were ahead of their time, but so are the other tribes. And if you look at people from the other tribes who are ahead of their times, they also have massive land claims in Kenya. What we have at the moment is you cannot have viable economic land in an age of globalization if you start carving the whole land into small holdings for subsistent farmers only. But neither can you ignore that the future unrest in Kenya will be based yet again on the unfair distribution of land. And water. And water, that is another thing that is coming quite clearly. So the hope lies in agreeing once and for all whether the Kenyan society is going to remain as undivided if you reject the division along the tribal lines, which means the tribal area lines, and if you accept that Kenya will be governed as one entity, then you've got to find a Kenya-wide solution. It's not a central province solution where Kikuyus are, or a Rift Valley solution where the Kalenjins are, or the yeah. Coast Province solution where the Mijikenda are. You're going to come up with a solution that is Kenya-wide. So, going back to that point, it's saying we need a Kenyan-wide solution, not a tribal wide solution because you've got 46 different tribes with 46 different areas, 46 different tribes, areas, cultures, languages. But that means that people have to accept then that there will be migrants who are not of their tribe or ethnic group but who might even come from four or five hundred miles away or something like that but they're still within the border of Kenya. Yes, to be a Kenyan first and to be a tribal second in terms of land distribution seems to me a much better way. If you go to be a tribal first, then you have a tribal claim to your own tribal area. Mm. Now remember, mm. two-thirds of Kenya is arid land. Only one-third is actually arable and productive. And that means that there's stretches of land that are not good for human settlement. Therefore, if you try to divide land in terms of tribal settlement, then there are some tribes who will be uh, shortchanged. You also, of course, have the demographic problem. I brought up the issue of water because one thing I heard was that these companies that are doing all the flowers and all the major, like the major export cash crops, they were actually siphoning off water at night so that they were taking more than their allocation off water and they were denying it during the day that they were actually taking that excess water. And obviously that is the, you know, that's going to bring, a, bring another cause for concern. When we talk about the big companies, all of them, or nearly all of them, are owned by politicians. Or politicians have a say in it. So these same politicians who are at each other's throats publicly also have deals and are partners in a lot of these big, like the flower companies in Nigeria. If you ask people in Kenya, they know who owns the flower companies. Now, in Nakuru, there is a pipeline that used to run from Gilgil to Kabarak. That is about 30 miles. And along the way, there are thousands of people who could not have access to that water because it was all going to one particular university, which was privately owned. Now, when I was in Kenya last August, the community themselves, with the help of the government, have been able to tap into this pipe 
And to use what? But you say you're talking about people for 15 years. A pipe just passed by your house, and you could not have access to water. There is a water problem. Water in Kenya is unevenly distributed, and you would need to take it from one particular area far to the another one. Tell us about the post-conflict work camp that you're organising. What we're trying to do with people from South Nairobi, this is student in Future Enterprise, is to try and work with the other young people, get young people from different tribes in Kenya to come and to work together over a two-week period. And what we're hoping they will do is in the morning they'll be working on a community project. And in the afternoon we will be talking and discussing and dialoguing about what happened in Kenya. These are school kids from different tribes who are being invited in at the centre. Will you be including indigenous methods of conflict resolution in your discussions there? I'm not sure what you mean by indigenous. Uh, Could you elaborate on that? Every group of people, every nation, every tribe, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to call them, right? They had ways of, in the past, distributing land. They had ways of dealing with offenders. They had ways of dealing with conflict within their own clan, within their own tribe, within their own nation but they also had a way of dealing with external. So, say, the Luo might have a way of dealing with the people who were their neighbours, right, of interacting with them, of resolving conflicts, of whatever. Everybody has that, right? Because they must have resolved disputes in the past, and it must have been a way that, in mm. a way that was acceptable to the people in the past, right? Because, obviously, a lot of people went along with it. So... Some of those methods must still be relevant. It doesn't mean that one size is going to fit all, but some of the mindset that allowed people to A, solve problems, and B, have it accepted by everybody who was within that area, some of that must still be relevant, surely. Yes, I think I get the point, and I think um, there are ways, just like there are ways of um, looking at society from a particular perspective. However, the work camp we are planning is very much around the Kenya we want. These are the ways of dealing with tribal-specific approaches to conflict management may come up. What we are trying to look at is how do you get some young people who are recently so polarized by the politics to the extent that they forgot their national identity and assumed their tribal identity not only to celebrate it, but to use it in order to maim and kill fellow Kenyans simply because they belong to a different tribe. Our approach is very much the Kenya we want. How do you become detribalized for the sake of the country without losing your tribal culture and tribal ways of being and tribal ways of looking at the world? So there is a tribal worldview. But how do you promote that tribal worldview in a post-conflict climate where at the same time you are trying to hammer out a national identity that is encompassing, that is inclusive? And part of that is like in a multiculturalism agenda where you celebrate what we have in common and you identify what divides us without making it an issue. So we do have, but don't forget that the context in which all this is happening is a globalized society Mm. where the national agenda for socioeconomic political approach is to a large extent dictated by economic forces beyond the national boundaries. Because sometimes I get concerned that, you know, people say, oh yeah, the solution is more democracy, but that democracy is a kind of like first past the post, winner takes all, I'm going to have it to the exclusion of everybody else. And that wasn't the original mindset that a lot of people governed by. Areas would be governed by a certain degree of consensus. And even if you didn't agree with the decision, you believed in the integrity of the person making the decision. And you believed that the person making that decision, the person who was going to enact the solution, was going to do it with the genuine interests of the well-being of the people. And I get concerned sometimes when I see first past the post winner takes all and I don't feel that people feel a part of that. They don't feel that 
the politicians, the bigger leaders, the bigger business people are actually there doing it for the benefit of the whole nation. They're not there doing it for the benefit of the whole region. In response to your question, remember, when you have a strong tribal leader, you have a strong tribal identity, you have a strong tribal culture, you have a strong community, tribal community, geographical. You can exercise a form of power and a, a form of doing things that honors the past memories and the past ways of doing things. The moment we started teaching people to read and write is the moment you started to unravel the old cultural ways of doing things. We now live in an age where people are detribalized, they're cosmopolitan. You've got kids growing up who don't speak their own language. The unifying language in Kenya is Swahili. Everybody speaks Swahili. That is the medium of communication and the medium by which people should be able to get an understanding. But we have about 40 different tribal radios. Every tribe has their own radio. They package their news in their own ways. So you touch base on a national level through Swahili and English, but you are still divided. If there was anything, I would say it would have to be something like the Tutu approach in South Africa, where you bring people around a concept that will redress the issues. You may have to have assumptions that are truly Kenyan, truly tribal, that put up the commission into being. But to get 46 tribes to cohere around one way, tribal way of doing things, it will be very difficult. Whoever is the stronger, and this could be purely in numbers. Remember we have people with positional power, other tribes have resource power, other people have land power, other people their power comes from their geographical location. So something like the truth and reconciliation approach in South Africa seems to me without having something similar but something that is informed by the Kenyan situation, the Kenyan tribe, the Kenyan way of doing things, but which will try to redress the issues seems a much healthier way forward. I'm going to come to the end of the interview, yeah. is there anything else you want to tell about the projects you run? One thing is if people went to our website www.nectuk Dot org, they can find some of the things we do, but also how to get in touch with us. We take people to Kenya, and if you want to come to Kenya as a group, a community group, a church group, with friends or individuals, we take people, they work with us, then we give them a holiday. They have to pay for it, of course, but they go off the beaten track. We are also doing a global citizenship workshop in Zanzibar in July 2008. Again, that information is available on our website. So what does that involve? We are getting students and young people and other interested parties from UK and East Africa and anywhere, Europe, to come and spend a week in Zanzibar looking at how global citizenship we know citizenship is now a curriculum item in UK and people have started looking at global citizenship People look at global citizenship differently. It's not about globalization. That is really taking things from us as we see it. Global citizenship is how do we, as marginalized individuals, what I would call the underbelly of citizens, begin to address the inadequacies of the global citizenship agenda. We are now being told to be global. We consume global. But we never think in terms of global when there are issues affecting some of the communities. So the workshop in Zanzibar, it's about that. Who is a global citizen? And we think that we hammer out how social justice becomes the underpinning assumption about global citizenship and not global consumerism. Okay, and finally, what are your hopes for Kenya? Oh, Kenya will pick itself up, dust itself, and looking back, I'm sure we'll be surprised four years from now when we look back at the next election, probably we will say what we have learned in Kenya this time has been the best lesson, not the crime. I know it's, it's been painful. The lessons, if we extract lessons from what has happened in Kenya after the last election, 
and people have for the first time begin to have a real dialogue about real issues and if we can get the old guards to relinquish their power most of it manipulative power if we can get people who have an internationalist outlook without selling to the globalization agenda we will see that these lessons learned as painful as they were they may be the best thing that begins to heal kenya and the kenyan society and ultimately the people of kenya okay nims thanks a lot a different perspective on the African world.